Hi there, my name is Jason, one of the pastors at Gospel Light Christian Church, and we are grateful that I can gather here together with you to look at the subject of effective sermon preparation in the 21st century. I dare not say that I'm a, an expert in this area, but I have been preaching for a long time now. Uh, to be exact, it's about 27 years. I look young, but I started young. And uh, by the grace of God, I have had wonderful times preparing and preaching God's word. And I just want to share a little of what I have uh, learned uh, over these years with you. I hope this will be a profitable session uh, for all of you. So let's begin in a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for this time that we can look into how we can understand the Bible and to present the Bible to your people that they may know you and your gospel, your grace, and your glory. I pray that your Holy Spirit would bless this time so that we all would benefit, that we all would be perhaps a little better in how we can handle the scripture and present the scripture. Hide your servant behind the cross. May your glory and Jesus alone be lifted up. Thank you. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. So let me share screen. I'm going to use quite a bit of PowerPoint, some videos, so that you can both hear and see, so that you can learn better. So um, the subject we have today, or for these four weeks or four sessions together, will be effective sermon preparation in the 21st century. Um, and this is really going to take us to four different emphasis. First one, which is about today, I'd like you to learn about what it means to focus on the Word of God. And so I've entitled this session, It's All About the Word, the Word of God. The next session will be all about the gospel. We need to understand that preaching is all about the gospel. What is the gospel and why is this so important? We'll look at that in the next session. The third session will be it's all about the preacher. God has chosen to use you and me, preachers, people, to deliver his word. And so we need to know what are the essential qualifications or factors or elements to an effective preacher. And number four, it's all about the people. Preaching is ultimately to people, and we've got to help them understand and apply the Word of God. And if we don't do that, we have failed as a preacher. So, if you were to look at this in another way, then I say preaching has a clear source. The source is the Word of God. It's not our opinions. It's not the world's ideas. It's the Word of God. Then it's all about the gospel. The central focus of the source gives us the substance. The substance of preaching, the main content of our preaching is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Then we need to understand the qualifications of the speaker, the preacher himself. And if you would have it, the last uh, factor we are going to look at is the significance. So what if we have preached the Bible? How is this going to be useful or impactful or relevant to the people? We've got to draw that out and we've got to connect to their lives. So today we're just going to look at it's all about the Word. It's all about the Bible. It's about the Word of God. And I begin with this statement. I hope you will accept it. I hope you will agree with it. I hope you will believe it in your own life. And it is this. If you want to be a good preacher, if you want to deliver God's word, then you've got to come to this very basic conviction that I have nothing of worth to share in and of myself. I, myself, have nothing of worth to share. There's nothing in this man there's no clever ideas, no clever ideology, no great concepts of worth to share with people. I have nothing to share, but I have the word of God and it is of infinite worth 
to share. Now, you can never be a good preacher of the Bible if you really think that you have a lot of good things to share from your own life, as if the ideas are of your own. If you believe in that, then I don't think you will go to the Bible as desperately as you should, and therefore you will not be able to teach the Bible as you should. This is my understanding. After all these 27 years of preaching, I have uh, over and over again come to realize that there is nothing of value in my life, no clever thoughts, no clever ideas that is of infinite or eternal value to share. But week after week, as I go into the Bible, study it and teach it, I find it so rich and precious for God's people, for myself and for God's people. So I've labored a long time in this because I want you to really know it's all about the word. Why? Because as a preacher, as a person, there's nothing of worth otherwise I can share. The Bible is infinitely worthy. Look at some of the Bible verses that say so. <clears throat> all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect or complete, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. There is a trend today for pastors, preachers, leaders of the church to learn from secular teachings. Maybe learn about management and leadership and oratorical skills. Now, I'm not saying these things are necessarily bad. I'm not saying that the preacher should be very, very ignorant of things in the world. Now, I'm not saying that. But I'm saying that we might have today lost that confidence in 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. Instead of being a man of the word, instead of specializing and focusing and really digging into the Bible, we look outside of the Bible to improve ourselves. But God has said that if you really learn the scriptures, all the scriptures is profitable and it is sufficient because this man of God who looks into the Bible can be perfect and thoroughly furnished unto all good works. The Bible is not only inerrant, but it is also sufficient. One of the major doctrines that the church will have to grapple with in our day and age is not just the inerrancy of Scripture, but the sufficiency of Scripture. I think that is being undermined today. People say that the Bible is not enough. You need signs and wonders. You need miracles and healing so that people may believe. I say to you, God may in his time choose to give miracles but the main way by which people may have faith is through the word of God. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God or the word of Christ. And so not only is the church being afflicted with this problem or with this temptation to doubt the sufficiency of scripture, even preachers, pastors, ourselves may slip into that trap. But today, let's all realize that preaching must be about the word and it is worthy. Uh, it is the right thing to do. It is the profitable thing to do because the word of God is sufficient to equip all people. And so let's be confident in teaching the Bible. How about this statement? By Jesus, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. People need to know the word. It's spiritual bread. It's spiritual nourishment. It's spiritual life. And so the early church leaders, the apostles, they understand the priority of the Bible. When there were practical needs around them, they appointed seven men to look into the distribution of needs to the widows. But they said themselves, we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. There was a focus, dedication to the ministry of the word. 
It's all about the word for the apostles. How about this? Paul saying to his protege, Timothy, I charge thee before, therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom, preach the word. Now, this is a very serious charge. He's not talking to his buddy. He's speaking as, as if he's someone in authority on behalf of God. He says, I charge you before God and the Lord Jesus Christ. I mean, this is a very weighty charge, invoking the name of God and his son, reminding Timothy that Jesus will come and judge. And the number one thing that the church contains is to preach the word. Don't just spin stories of your own. Don't just come up with moral lessons of your own. Don't just pluck ideas from the world and deliver them in the pulpit, but preach the word. Teach the Bible. It's all about the word. So they read in the book, in the law of God, distinctly and gave the sense. It's important that when we teach the Bible, we need to explain we need to help people understand. We need to give the sense. So teaching, preaching, is not using the Bible to teach your ideas, but it is to go into the Bible and to expose the ideas, unfold the ideas. We call this exegesis. What is exegesis? Exegesis means to bring out what the Bible says. You see, exa, from which you also, the root from which you get also the words exit or exodus means to be out. So exegesis means you take what is in the Bible and you bring it out. Exegesis. So you're saying what the Bible has to say. You're just taking things out from the Bible. You're pulling it out. You're bringing it, bringing it to the surface. That's all you do. The Bible is your source. It brings out, you bring out the meaning, the understanding from the Word of God. John Brodus, the father of expository teaching, says that the main points and the sub-points of your message all flows from the text. It has to. From this passage, you bring out what is the truth within, the main points, the sub-points, it must all be from the text. It is not ideas you take elsewhere and you put it into the text. No, 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 no. You bring it out from the text. So that is exegesis as contrasted with eisegesis. Eisegesis means you read into the text. Maybe you have an idea of money. And even though the text does not talk about money, you read money into the text because you are thinking about money. You want to talk about money and you're just making the Bible say what you want it to say. Now, that is not good. That is not right because you're not honoring the Bible for what it is. That's, that's eisegesis. The interpreter makes the scripture say what he wants it to say. Now, that's wrong. We are here to teach the Bible, preach the word. So exegesis, not eisegesis. Now let me show, it, sh show you an interesting little video uh, about how dangerous it is for us to read the Bible out of context. So take a look at this uh, little video. It may be a little bit out of sync, but I hope you listen in and um, have a good laugh and learn at the same time. One day, I, I was sitting in my room, I was actually reading the Bible, and uh, I came to Luke 137, and it says, for nothing is impossible with God. And it was like the words of Scripture left off the page and into my heart. And in that moment, I read that verse, I thought, nothing is impossible with God. And somehow, it triggered and went from there to, if that's true, then I could dunk the basketball. And if I could talk to basketball, like, coach got to put me on the team. Like, you can't not be if I 
dunk it on guys. So, so I left my Bible sitting there in my room. I went outside where we had a basketball uh, goal. I got a basketball uh, in our driveway. I got a basketball. I went to the back of the driveway. And uh, I got down on my knees and I said, God, your word says nothing is impossible with you. I believe with your power I can dunk this basketball. And so then I got up, and now I wanted everything to be perfect. So I planned out how many steps it was going to take for me to get from the back of the driveway to the goal. So I planned out how many steps it was going to take. And then my plan was, uh, uh, so follow with me. My plan was the last two steps I was going to close my eyes. I was going to jump with my eyes closed. That way I could picture the angels lifting me up to the goal. <laughs> the, ne- the next thing I'm going to feel is the, the, the rim. I'm going to throw the ball to the rim. And then my plan was I'm going to hang there for a while because I've never been up there before. So <laughs> that, that was the plan. So I go back. So true story. True story. I go back to the back of the goal. I get down on my knees one more time. I mean, normal day, cars driving by, people walking by. Normal day for them. I'm having revival right here in the driveway. I got to believe with your power I can dunk this ball. So I pick up the ball. I start running. And running, I got every step planned out. I got two feet away. I close my eyes. Well, before I tell you what happened, just be honest. And obviously I can't see people in simulcast, but in this room, how many of you Knowing this true story, how many of you think that I dunked the basketball on that day? Just raise your hand. <laughs> I see, like, two hands, three. Now you just kind of feel sorry for me. Uh, how many of you say there's no chance? All right. True story. I run every step plan out. I get two steps away. I close my eyes. I take the last two steps of my eyes closed. I could feel something on my right and my left. Like I could feel something. And the next thing I felt was that basketball pole right in my forehead. (laughs) I want you to imagine walking by my house on that day. You see this little kid get up off his knees, supposedly in prayer, and just go running and jump into a pole. (laughs) Ah. So, uh, (laughs) so the reason I tell you that story, (laughs) Luke 137, the whole passage is about the virgin birth. All right? That's the point of the text. Not you can dunk as a four foot, nothing kid. Like, that's not what the text means. It's about the virgin birth. So, anyway, it's important before you hurt yourself, like, <laughs> learn the context of the passage, all right? All right, I hope that was fun for you. Um, It's a simple illustration how we need to be careful not to uh, take things out of context. Don't just make the Bible say what you want it to say. Oh, the Bible, I I want to dunk the basketball. So I look for Luke 137. Well, look at the text. That verse is in the context of the virgin birth. And so uh, we need to be better students, all right, of the Bible to really get to what God is saying in the text and simply bring it out. Now, why is this so important to give the sense, to help people understand? uh, Why is it so important not to go to the world and even our own brains to, to preach, but to really go into the Bible itself? It is with this fundamental reason. We need to go to the Word of God because it is only the Word of God that reveals the God of the Word. This is a very big statement. The Word of God reveals the God of the Word. God has revealed Himself in the Bible. Now, it is true that God has revealed Himself in creation. We see His wisdom, His power in all of creation. But Even more clearly, God reveals himself in the word of God. And if we do not go to the word of God, we will not really know God. 
Because God cannot be known by our rationalization or our imagination or our deduction because we have very fallen minds. Our minds are corrupted by sin. So if you were to sit under a coconut tree and try to figure God out without the Bible, you will come out with what the world has already come out, which is idols, animals, creatures, human beings. You fashion them to be images of God, but that is so wrong. And you know why? Because our minds are so corrupt. It is so damaged. It is so destroyed, defaced, that it cannot figure God out. So God in his mercy gives us the Bible. God cannot be known by our imagination or deduction. He can be known only by revelation. And the revelation of God is in the word of God. So why must we be preachers of the word? Because we want people to know God. And the best way for people to know God is to know his word. The word of God reveals the God of the word. God must reveal himself. That's the point of the Bible. Because of our sins, we could never know God otherwise. Either he speaks or we are forever lost in the darkness of our own speculations. Take away the Bible from this world and we are goddess. We are no hopers. We will not know God. But God has given the Bible. That's the point. That's the joy. That's the privilege. You and I as preachers have. We can tell people about God that they may know him. Otherwise, the world will be like these blind men trying to figure out an elephant. You know the story. They are blind. They cannot see properly. So they can feel uh, some parts of the elephant, but they will never have a right understanding of the elephant. And so it is for us. We are spiritually blind. We may perceive a little here and there about God, but because we don't see the whole picture, it will be a very deformed idea, a very mutated idea of God. It is a very wrong idea of God. God is not a rope. God is not a wall. God is not a tree, just like maybe how people think God is today. So, very important for us to study the Word of God because it reveals the Word of the God of the Word. Very important for you and I to be preachers of the Word of God so that people may get to know the God of the Word. So, God has given revelation. He has revealed himself in the Bible. Our job is to give an exposition of the Word of God, to teach and to bring out, to exegete the Word of God. And when we exegete or give an exposition of the Word of God, people can now have information of, on God. They can now know God and they can then have a right relationship with God. And so the church may be a healthy church. What do you want? A big but sick church? Or do you want a healthy church that may be small for the beginning, but if it's healthy, it will grow? I want a healthy church. I long for a healthy church. And that can only be done, or that can only be arrived at if God's preachers are teaching the Word of God and exegeting the Word of God in the right way. So, a healthy church is a church that hears the word of God and continues to hear the word of God. And it therefore requires preachers who will preach the word of God. The preaching of the word of God must be absolutely central. Sound, expositional preaching is often the fountainhead of growth in a church. What you're going through today is absolutely important. Do you realize that? It is crucial to the spiritual health and flourishing of the people of God under your care. So this morning, or today, we are all learning about the importance of the word. Now, I've given you the, I hope, theological understanding, underpinnings of why this is so important. I'd like to now take the remaining time I have to just bring you through some practical resources, all right? I, I, I want to be useful. I want to be helpful. 
And I know I've said it is so important for all of you to be students and, and exegetes of the Bible, but some of you may say it's very hard. I have my Bible, I, I sit on my desk, I read it for a whole day and I still cannot figure out what it is. Well, I say to you, yes, sometimes we just need to read more. We just need to read longer. We just need to persist more. But sometimes we will need help. Actually, every single week when I prepare for preaching, for all these 27 years, I've always used help. Now, I don't, I, I don't believe in all these 27 years, I've copied any sermon. I haven't. You can check out the messages on our website and I, I can share with you that I don't copy uh, I do not uh, plagiarize, but I do learn. I do benefit. I do get helped and taught by many commentators and preachers and pastors. They have helped me in my understanding. They have added to my understanding. They have filled in the gaps in my understanding. So I'm not ashamed to say, please get help. Now, don't. Just read commentators without digging into the Bible yourself. But there is a good balance that I think wise preachers should strike. And that is to dig into the Bible and at the same time use help in a, in a timely and wise way. So what are the resources I go to when I study the Bible and I feel I'm not understanding this correctly? or I feel that there is more there, but I just can't identify, or I need more substance and maybe others can help me dig out more gems from this same text. Where do I go? Well, let me bring you to a very simple resource. It's called, ta-da, Google. All right? I'm sure every one of you uh, knows what Google is. And uh, the, the great thing I'm sharing here is you don't need to buy any books from Amazon or from Kindle, anything like that. You don't have to spend a single cent. Now, there are ways, you, there are resources where you have to spend, but what I'm sharing with you today is FOC, free of charge, readily available. All you need is a device like a handphone or computer and internet, and you can have it. So let me demonstrate. I just show you maybe two websites today that can be useful. First, let's give an example. Let's say you want to study the book of Galatians. All right? You're studying Galatians. You're reading it on your own and you feel you are not really getting it. What do you do? Well, I go to Galatians and I key in precept. Austin. You see that? That's all. Enter. First result, I go to Galatians commentaries and sermons and it will lead me to this page. Now, you can scroll through all the resources that, has been, that have been collated and put into this one page for you to enjoy and to use free of charge. My issue for you is not that you have too little support. My issue for you when you use something like this is that you have so much, you have a hard time figuring out which one you want to use. So I'm not here to tell you which one is most suitable for you because different books like Galatians, Romans, and so on, there will be different authors, different commentators. So I can't be universal here, but if you use it long enough and if you try it long enough, you would figure out who you feel is better, more suitable, and then you can repeatedly go back if it's chapter 1, verse 1 to 5, then chapters 1, verse 6 to 12, whatever that may be, you can, you can uh, pick on the favorites, the ones that you have benefited most and continue using him more, uh, him as the preacher. So uh, just giving you a tour of some of the names here. Um, maybe some of the names are a little bit unfamiliar. That's fine. Uh, some names may be familiar, like John Kelvin, you can see. Uh, Chris Well, you can see. Um, you will have people like... Uh, 
Let me just go through a little bit. Matthew Henry, you see that name. These are names you may be familiar with. Lewis Johnson, um, Martin Luther, John MacArthur, uh, Alexander McLaren. Some of them are old. Uh, they, are, they are written in a very long-winded way. Maybe that's not what you like. That's fine. There are also newer ones. But I would say generally these are the... Uh, curated ones. Whoever the uh, founder of Precept Austin, he has kind of selected some famous names or some uh, trusted names to put in here. Um, I wouldn't say everyone, please understand, not everyone is going to be absolutely in the same theological perspective as you. And I would say not everyone here is worthy to be read. You've got to still exercise discernment. But I still think this is a good available resource. All right, you have Ray Statement, you have Charles Swindoll. Um, if you, you see, I, I, I've been talking for so long and we haven't even finished. Uh, we have John Piper, Ray Pritchard. Uh, there are so many names here. You, you, you can take your own time, all right? But my encouragement here to you is, you have a lot of help in today's day and age, free of charge, at any time you want. You wake up at 3 a.m. because you can't sleep as a result of thinking through your sermon, you have this resource, all right? So maybe I, let me show you again one more time. Uh, let's say we want Hebrews. Again, the keyword at the back is Precept Austin, enter Hebrews. And again, you have the same set up different names, um, different authors, every verse, every chapter, different people. Like I said, you are spoiled for choice. All right, so I hope this is a very useful resource. I use it today every week. I use it for my sermon prep. Uh, it's easy to use, it's free. It doesn't take a genius to figure things out from here. And so I hope it's useful. Now, some people use Logos, that's fine, uh, except you've got to pay for it. Uh, but all these are online resources. You don't need a large library. You don't need a lot of room in your house. Uh, you don't even need to pay. Logos, you still need to pay. All right, so one more resource I would share with you um, is with regards to, let's say, the Hebrew and Greek words. Sometimes you read a passage and you know that to exegete it, you've got to really know what this word means. Or maybe a commentary mentions about the Greek or Hebrew of this word and you say, I want to be sure. I want to find out. I think for most of us, we will never be Greek or Hebrew scholars. Correct? <laughs> I speak English and Chinese, but I, I say up to today, I dare not say I'm a I'm an expert or authority on English and Chinese. I, I can't. I, I'm just not gifted in that area. So when I have a problem with English or Chinese, I go to a dictionary. So for, for most of you, you, you might have studied some Hebrew and Greek. That's good. Nothing wrong with that. But to say that you can be a master at it or an expert at it, I think that's not realistic. So what do I do? I go to resources. I go to helps. So to help you in some of the words, uh, whether it's the meaning or the tense, I go to this website called BLB. It's called Blue Letter Bible. All you need to know is BLB. And you can go into this website, just click into it, and uh, choose any verse, choose any passage. Um, let's choose Romans chapter 1. And we have every verse here. And for example, I want to find out about the word servant. I just need to click on tools. And here you go. Paul, Paulos, that's the Greek. And then a servant. Then you see the Greek word here, doulos. Huh, interesting. So let's understand what doulos means. G1401, click on it. And you have all these explanations available for you. If you like, you can look more at 
Vine's explanation, TDNT, and so on and so forth. So there is a lot of resources available. Have fun enjoying the use of, uh, of BLB and you have all the concordance or the occurrences where it appears in the Bible and you can do this for verse after verse. You may even want to find out how it is pronounced. Click on this. Strong's G, 1401, doulos. Doulos. So you will not sound stupid, right? <laughs> Reading a Greek word which you don't know because there are people who can help you pronounce as well. And if you go back, um, let's say the word called. Let's look at the word called. It's the same word uh, in English. Uh, you have the same understanding. Um, yeah, all these words, all these resources at your fingertips. Um, you may even look at, for those who are familiar with tenses, Greek tenses, you can have further details here, but this may be a bit more advanced level. So these are the two resources I'd like to share with you. Precept Austin, BLB, and I hope they are useful hammers and uh, saws, tools for you to get into the Bible, to exegete the Bible, and to help your people with the Bible that they may know the God of the Bible. May you have a healthy church as you apply yourself to teaching and preaching God's word. All right, let's close in prayer. Father, thank you for this time. Bless your people as they apply themselves to diligently preparing the word of God week after week. We pray through them, your word will be faithfully taught to the people that they may know you, have a right relationship with you, and that the church may be healthy for your glory. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless.